Welcome to Watch Mojo series, How Pokemon Became a Global Phenomenon. From humble origins, Pokemon has evolved into the world's largest media franchise, turning pocket monsters into worldwide Pokemania. Join us as we look at how Pokemon video games, trading cards, and anime became pop culture giants. Hey guys, it's Ash here with Watch Mojo, and today we're going to take a look at how Ash and Pikachu became household names. Because whether it's the anime, the TCG, or the video games, people have been enamored with this series for quite some time. But how did a series inspired by bug catching become so popular? Let's take a look. It's crazy to think that one relatively small game developer gave birth to the massive multimedia franchise we know today. Founded in the 1980s, Game Freak was initially a small, self-published video game magazine created by Satoshi Taijiri and illustrated by Ken Sugimori. The magazine found modest success, with its best-performing issue selling over 10,000 copies. But it wasn't long before Tajiri began to aim for bigger and better things. Growing disillusioned with the quality of the latest video game releases, Satoshi Tajiri decided to try his hand in video game development. After purchasing the hardware required and studying the basics, he, alongside Ken Sugimori and Junichi Masuda, would go on to develop games for big-name publishers such as Namco, Sega, and Nintendo. It was during the release of these games that Satoshi Tajiri would begin the initial concepts for what would eventually become Pocket Monsters. Tajiri would first conceive the idea after seeing Nintendo's Game Boy handheld system and its ability to connect to another with the Game Link cable. Harkening back to his childhood hobby of collecting bugs, Tajiri envisioned trading creatures between systems. After a successful pitch to Nintendo, Game Freak would go on to develop the game for nearly six whole years, something that almost bankrupted the company on many occasions. <laughs> <laughs> Pocket Monsters Red and Green was finally released in Japan on February 28, 1996. Although it was not expected to do well, the games quickly found success due to great reviews and also the fact that there were two versions, which led to many consumers purchasing both of them. Although the game was advertised to contain 150 Pokemon, Tajiri secretly coded in one extra Pokemon to the game called Mew that not even Nintendo was aware of. <laughs> Rumors of this secret Pokemon helped increase the overall interest in the game, and as popularity grew in Japan, the games were eventually adapted into other forms of media, such as an anime series, manga, and even a trading card game. But none of this would compare to the global phenomenon that was to come. Hey, little buddy, want to ride? Pikachu! Yeah, whatever! The Pocket Monsters franchise finally made its way to the West under the acronym of Pokemon, with the airing of the first episode of the anime series. Just a couple of weeks later, on September 28, 1998, the Pokemon Red and Blue video games released to critical acclaim, and combined with the anime series, trading card game, and an abundance of merchandise, the franchise was an instant mega hit. The game would go on to sell a combined 4 million by the end of the year in the United States, and worldwide sales reached over 31 million by the end of their run. During the peak of Pokemon's popularity, Nintendo released a number of spin-off titles, such as Pokemon Pinball and Pokemon Snap. The most impressive spin-off of the time, however, was Pokemon Stadium, which allowed players to battle with their Pokemon from red and blue in full 3D on a console via the Nintendo 64 transfer pack. 
Pokemon Stadium became the best-selling console game of 2000 in North America, which was an incredibly big deal at the time, considering how much the Nintendo 64 struggled against its competitor, PlayStation. <laughs> With the great success of Pokemon Red and Blue, Game Freak followed up with Pokemon Yellow Vision Special Pikachu Edition, an updated version of the original game that was heavily influenced by the anime series. But a true sequel wouldn't arrive for another year. The hotly anticipated sequels Pokemon Gold and Silver finally arrived on October 15th, 2000, and continued the success of its predecessors. The games were the highest selling of the year and are considered by some to be the best in the series. The mainline series of games continued onto Nintendo's next handheld system, the Game Boy Advance, with the release of Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire and the remakes of the originals Fire Red and Leaf Green. The franchise cooled off a little during this generation, but soon found its footing again with the release of Nintendo's best-selling video game console of all time, the Nintendo DS. This system became the home for multiple Pokemon games thanks to its long lifespan, with titles such as Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, and later Pokemon Black and White. Nintendo's follow-up handheld console, the 3DS, initially struggled from poor sales. However, thanks to a price drop and the release of the first ever 3D games in the mainline series, Pokemon X and Y, sales quickly began to pick up. But this was nothing compared to the storm Pokemon was about to unleash upon the world. Developed by American software company Niantic, Pokemon Go was released for iOS and Android on July 6, 2016. The game allowed players to locate and capture Pokemon in the real world via the GPS on their mobile devices. To say this game was a hit is an absolute understatement, as it ushered in the second coming of Pokemania. During the summer of 2016, you'd be hard-pressed not to find someone on the streets trying their best to capture Pokemon. But if that's not your style, guaranteed you will see plenty of others walking around, gathering, and battling Pokemon. The game is one of the most profitable apps of all time, and has been downloaded more than 500 million times worldwide. Its success caused the sales of Pokemon X and Y to skyrocket, and also put a lot of attention on the newly released Pokemon Sun and Moon just a few months later. <laughs> The phenomenal success of Pokemon Go was enough to influence Game Freak's next release with Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee, the first mainline Pokemon games released for a home console, the Nintendo Switch. Both of these games would feature some of the same mechanics and would even allow players to transfer their Pokemon from Pokemon Go. Game Freak would later return to its roots a year later on the Nintendo Switch with Pokemon Sword and Shield which would go on to sell more than 21 million copies worldwide. The mainline Pokemon video games are just as strong as ever, as following the remakes of Diamond and Pill, the series went in a brand new direction with Pokemon Legends Arceus. This new title took players to the Sinnoh region's past and allowed them to capture and battle Pokemon in ways never seen before. Later that year, Game Freak would release Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, which would have players take on a brand new Pokemon journey within a massive open world. The Pokemon video games let us live out our dreams of becoming Pokemon trainers, and so too did the TCG in a different, more tactile way, because there's nothing quite like opening a booster pack and pulling some brilliant cards. And of course, the video games saw a massive evolution over the years, but so too did the TCG, so let's take a look. Hey little buddy, wanna ride? Pikachu! 
In early days of Pokemon, most fans were first introduced to the franchise in 1998 via the original Red and Blue games for the Game Boy. It goes without saying they were hugely successful, so when the Pokemon trading card game arrived, it was like being able to hold a piece of the action. Well, I like Pokemon because it's fun to play. Since you couldn't go out looking for real life Pokemon, card collecting immediately allowed children to feel like Pokemon trainers themselves, hunting for their favorite pocket monsters in a booster pack. Are you ready for Pikachu? Yeah! In those days, you usually had to choose between the classic base set, jungle, or fossil. These three sets served as a direct companion to the games, and still to this day, they are probably the most beloved for that reason. It was the first time we got to lay eyes on the majestic artwork of illustrators like Ken Sugimori and Mitsuhiro Arita. These packs contained all the 150 lovable and cute monsters we were already used to from the video games and the anime. Squirtle, Wotero, Blastoise. So it's only natural that the trading card game blew up immediately. Because it does the most damage and it has the most HP. Although the common and uncommon cards had uses in the game itself, a lot of kids were solely after the holographic cards like Charizard, Venusaur, and Blastoise. So you can imagine how easily trade deals would go awry on the playground. He swapped three Game Boy games, which have a value of about $150, for one Pokemon card. Whether you played the actual game and went to tournaments, or simply collected the cards, being a part of the initial Pokemon TCG craze was strange and exciting. Well, my main goal is sort of like to beat his Pokemon, and then I get to win. The yellow mouse's face was everywhere, even on jumbo jets. Topeka, Kansas was renamed to Topikachu for a day. Even Christopher Moltisanti of The Sopranos wanted a piece of the action. Oh, oh, tonight, puss, I got something hard edge. What? Pokemon cards. Me and Tommy Mac are taking down a truckload. Yeah? Where? Tommy knows. You in? What, me? On the other hand, schools started implementing bans after too many hurt feelings and lopsided trades. We do not bring Pokemon cards to school. Remember that, please, fellas, because if you do, they will be taken and given back to you at the end of the day to take home, not to reappear. When the first movie opened, kids skipped school to watch it in what the New York Times described as a case of pokey flu. The second generation of cards to arrive with the Neo series in 2000, which introduced shining Pokemon to the trading card game, as well as light and dark variations. Will you choose to play the dark Pokemon? Or are you destined to play the light Pokemon? What's your destiny? While some people hadn't even finished the first 150, these sets introduced all the Pokemon from the gold and silver games for the Game Boy Color. In addition to collecting shinies and second generation starters, you could also hunt down the first holographic Lugia card, which would go on to become extremely valuable. By 2002, they dabbled with the E-Card series, cards in these sets, which were Expedition, Aquabolis, and Sky Ridge, had an e-reader strip, which could be entered into the companion attachment for the Game Boy to reveal extra features and games. It wasn't a huge success, but the cards were nonetheless amazing and featured designs that moved the game's aesthetic forward. Charmander. Ooh, there's a nice pull right there. This was also the last collaboration between Pokemon and Wizards of the Coast, the US company that had been supplying the cards in North America since the very beginning. With the departure of Wizards, the Pokemon Company International took over production of the TCG entirely for the third generation in 2003. 109 new cards, over 40 new Pokemon, two on two battles, Advance your game. These sets, starting with EX Ruby and Sapphire, were the first to feature Pokemon EX, in addition to Prime, Level X, and Legend cards. By this point in time, though, interest in Pokemon had slowed down a little. Many of the kids who once sported mushroom cuts and trainers were now becoming edgy teenagers who were too cool to be messing about with pocket monsters. Some picked up a skateboard after Tony Hawk's Pro Skater made the rounds. Others simply switched over to Digimon or Dragon Ball Z. I'm ultimate! I'm champion! I'm mega! No way! 
There was no shortage of amazing franchises getting off the ground at this time. As a result, the mid-2000s onward was less of a frenzy for Pokemon card collectors. It wasn't really in the immediate spotlight anymore. Video game consoles were getting a lot better, there were new Harry Potter movies on the horizon, and the generation that welcomed Pikachu and company into their lives in the late 90s was slowly growing out of it. While there's plenty of amazing cards to look at and collect from these years, more than we have time to show you in this video, it wasn't until the Black and White series in the 2010s that Pokemon really shook things up with their products. 70 new Pokemon, more than 110 cards! These games ushered in the legendary Pokemon Reshiram and Zekrom, who were available as full art cards for the first time. A new tier of rarity, full art cards extended beyond the normal illustration window and usually have some kind of embossed texture on the card. We got the Reshiram full art ultra rare. Oh my gosh! These products were part of a fresh start that looked to bring in new generations of trainers to the game. To cap off these 6th generation sets, Pokemon released Evolutions in 2016, which featured reprints of some of the classic artworks from the original 150, created to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Pokemon. While not everyone was a fan, it's this combination of nostalgia and innovation that made the franchise such a phenomenal success. Mewtwo strikes back! The original Mewtwo card has returned, now twice as strong as before. If you're a Pokemon card fan, you probably know where we're going next. Before, we said the Pokemon Black and White era brought in a new age of collectors and players. Well, the Pokemon boom of 2020 did that tenfold. When the pandemic hit early that year, the world had to adjust to living in isolation. Many took up the collecting hobby during this time, as it was something fun and safe that you could do from the comfort of your home. Popular YouTube channels like Leonhardt, Lootbox TV, Unlisted Leaf, Real Breaking Nate, and more provided an endless supply of incredible videos that showcased the beloved packs from back in the day. Others went hunting in the attic to uncover their childhood collections. Whether it was sports cards you were into or Pokemon, collecting was once again alive and well. Let's uh, SAT word of the day, impeccable. impeccable. Meaning your card is perfect. But here's where things got a little bit insane. On September 2nd, 2020, YouTube creator Logan Paul announced he was investing in Pokemon cards, having seen the trend spiking during the pandemic. One of his first purchases was an original sealed first edition base set booster box, which he bought for a record-breaking $200,000. He sold the packs inside at $11,000 a pop and opened them on a live stream. Between his Twitch audience, 23 million YouTube subscribers, and 20 million Instagram followers, you can only imagine how many fresh sets of eyes were being exposed to the exciting world of Pokemon, and specifically, the TCG, many for the first time. PSA has agreed to put this little tag, this Logan Paul break, up top to give it like an extra premium. Before you know it, Logic and Steve Aoki were joining in on the fun, and next thing you knew, everyone and his dog wanted to open Pokemon cards. However, due to the pandemic, supply was shrinking just as demand was spiking. This combination of factors had new collectors competing with scalpers who were leaving the shelves bare. There were even altercations over sealed trading card products. It got so bad that big box retailers like Target announced they were suspending the sales of trading card products. Meanwhile, Pokemon card sales on eBay jumped 500% and grading services like PSA had to stop accepting submissions due to the influx of new creators. Two, one, pull it! <laughs> Evolution saw a huge spike in interest, as it was more affordable than the $500 and up base set packs from the late 90s. Luckily, the Pokemania has calmed down a little since then, and the prices on high-level cards have come down significantly from the astronomical peaks of 2020. What was clearer than ever during this time, however, was the incomparable level of nostalgia and excitement that Pokemon can conjure up. For a generation that's just lived through a pandemic and faces an uncertain future, 
This hobby brings us back to a basically pre-internet time where life was simpler, when battling and collecting Pokemon was our biggest concern. It gives us a, a way to connect. It gives me and Andrew a chance to hang out today, be a part of the tournament, and things we can do together. When we get so into the video games, it's between them and the TV. This is us. Now, a new generation of collectors has been established. What's amazing is that if you happen to still enjoy collecting Pokemon, there's no shortage of new sets and products to choose from. That lightning in a bottle feel of pulling your favorite Pokemon is still alive too, as they continue to elevate the artwork and design of the cards. For example, alternate art cards have become a vessel to tell an entire story with one single artwork, namely from new sets like Evolving Skies and Chilling Rain. This style of artwork immediately became a fan favorite, and fortunately for collectors, it looks like it will be carried forward in the new Scarlet and Violet era. It seems as if there's an endless supply of creative directions they could take with this TCG. And if the last few years are any indication, there's no shortage of fans in sight. The TCG has of course blown up in recent years, but for some people such as myself, the anime is always going to be king. And I'll never forget my favorite moments in episode 66, Snow Way Out, when Ash and all his little Pokemon huddle together in that cave. And just thinking about it makes me want to cry. But we almost didn't get that far, as episode 38 was so controversial, the series went on a long hiatus. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's go back to the start. It's really hard to imagine a world without Pokemon. For the better part of 25 years, the series has absolutely dominated the video game and trading card landscapes. But perhaps its most notable accomplishment is that of the anime, an industry titan with over 1,100 episodes to its name, all revolving around a little boy, a yellow mouse, and their quest to become the very best like no one ever was. But how did we get here? How did Pokemon become the universally known name it is today? Let's have a little look. Pokemon Master! That is what I'll- Ash, get to bed! In 1997, Japanese animation studio OLM, or Oriental Light and Magic, was tasked with creating a new animated series for TV Tokyo that capitalized on the burning hot video game series that had taken over Japan. They created Satoshi as the lead of the series, whose design was heavily based on Red, the hero from the video games. But still, they needed a mascot, a Pokemon who could carry the franchise with its easily recognizable design and merchandise selling adorability. And who better than Clefairy? And what, you were expecting someone else? Clefairy had already proven to be popular in the Koro Koro comic manga adaptation of the series, so why not make him the anime's hero too? Well, somewhere during production, they realized that Clefairy's appeal was skewed towards their female demographic. They wanted something that would be a hit with both boys and girls, so they flipped through the Pokédex in search of a character with bright colors and a pet-like charm. And that's when they stumbled upon the electric mouse. Pikachu. Pikachu was the perfect blend of cute, eye-catching, and recognizable. The production committee signed him up as Satoshi's partner, and they went off on their journey together. So yeah, it's thanks to the anime that Pikachu became the mascot of the entire franchise. <laughs> OLM changed a few things from the video games, like the whole Pokemon only saying their names thing. Yep, apparently OLM wanted Pokemon to speak the same as humans, but Game Freak hated the idea, and this was their compromise. But for the most part, they stuck to the same roadmap as the red and blue Pokemon games, only with the protagonist losing frequently and seldom catching any Pokemon, let alone all of them. Welcome to the team, Squirtle. Squirtle. The show proved an instant success in Japan, 
With children tuning in every week to watch Satoshi travel with his companions, Kazumi and Takeshi, meeting new monsters, winning gym badges, and thwarting the efforts of Team Rocket as they try to steal his beloved Pikachu. However, all this progress came to a screeching halt on December 16th, 1997, in an incident that could have ended the Pokemon dream for good. On this day, the episode titled Cyber Soldier Porygon aired, and the results were dire. <laughs> During the climax of the episode, the Pokemon Porygon causes an explosion that was animated with flashing strobe lights. As a result, 685 children across Japan watching the episode experienced seizure-like symptoms and had to be rushed to hospitals. It was a major controversy, and the show was taken off the air. After a four-month hiatus, Pokemon was back to right its wrongs. They aired an informative apology segment and the new episode, Pikachu's Goodbye, which is cited by many as one of the most important episodes of the series due to its emotional impact. The series quickly recovered from the bad press, and Pokemania was back. And that's about the time the West started to take notice. The series was licensed by the company 4Kids Entertainment, a studio that's been criticized for their eagerness to censor localized content. Nothing beats a jelly-filled donut. Unsurprisingly, they did just that. But that didn't deter the young Western audiences from falling in love with the Pokemon television series as it aired on CW Kids in America, Teletoon in Canada, Sky One in the United Kingdom, and many more across the globe. Here Satoshi became Ash Ketchum, Kasumi became Misty, Musashi and Kojiro became Jesse and James, and so on and so forth. You got a Pokemon and a new friend. Yeah! For every piece they left on the cutting room floor, four kids, to their credit, replaced it with something equally as memorable, the music videos. To this day, the pokey rap pops up in many bars at late hours across the globe. Almost any fan can bust out every lyric. Electro Diglett, Nidoran, Mankey, Venusaur, Tata, Firo, Pidgey, Z King, Jolteon, Dragonite, Gaslet, Pony Tower, Porygon, Polly Rap, Butterfree! Get you, get you, gotta catch and no one can deny the impact of Pikachu's jukebox with hits like Together Forever, What Kind of Pokemon Are You?, and the iconic To Be A Master. A capture. We have to appreciate the gravity of the Pokemon anime's success. While shows like Dragon Ball Z did a lot of the heavy lifting, it can be said that Pokemon truly introduced a whole generation of Western audiences to Japanese animation. Pokemania at this point dominated not only Japan, but also the rest of the world. Then something unprecedented happened. Pokemon the first movie. You are as pathetic as the rest. While the film was released to wild success in Japan in 1998, it wasn't until a year later that it reached the States and became the first anime movie to receive a wide release in the country. For a time, Pokemon the first movie held the record as the highest grossing opening to an animated film, making over $10 million on its first day. You probably remember those awesome Burger King promotional toys around that time. From there, Pokemon was able to reach new heights as the anime started to influence the video games with a re-release of Pokemon Red and Blue as Pokemon Yellow. It featured Pikachu as the starter Pokemon and several cameos from the television series. They even made a live stage play based on the anime series, but uh, well, the less said about that, the better. As the years passed, the Pokemon anime would maintain its solid audience, 
perhaps not quite as intense as in its Kanto heyday, but still passionate enough as Ash traveled through Johto, Hoenn, Sinnoh, and so on, following each new video game release. Hello! I'm Ash! I'm from Pallet Town! I'd like a battle! The anime would eventually draw more eyes towards it with the X and Y series in 2013, which many cite as the strongest in the entire franchise due to its focus on storytelling and high-quality Sakuga animation. But in Japan in 2014, something was changing. Pokemon was waning in popularity compared to a new rival series, Yokai Watch. Many young children began to put down their Pikachu plushies and pick up a Jibanyan instead. Yokai Watch's focus on humor and creatures packed with personality was drawing eyes away. But the Pokemon Company wasn't going to take it sitting down. They decided to take a page out of the Yokai book with the Sun and Moon series, which saw Ash halt his travels to kick back in the paradise like Alola region, tackling smaller mysteries with his school friends. Very similar indeed. They also adopted a more simplistic art and animation style, allowing for goofier reactions and humorous interactions. Oh, it's sweet and yummy! It's completely sour! Is it? Sour, 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 sour! Old school Pokemon fans were not so keen on the changes, but it managed to grasp an entire new generation of young viewers. However, fans of every age came together with the series' conclusion, which saw Ash Ketchum, after over 20 years, finally achieve his dream of winning a Pokemon League. Congratulations! <sighs> Thank you so much! Buddy, look! Pocket Monsters was big again. With the series that's followed, they've returned a little closer to their roots, proving that they simply refused to sit still. What's more, Journeys is the first series to be exclusive to Netflix in the US, a massive change in direction that's proven that streaming services are perhaps becoming the more dominant medium over television. Guess this is what you meant by them learning to live on their own. It would, however, prove to be Ash Ketchum's final journey as, upon becoming world champion, he would hang up his boots as the protagonist of the Pokemon anime. He'll be replaced by two new trainers in Pokemon Horizons. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure to go into your settings and switch on notifications. Yes, Pokemon continues to grow and adapt. While the anime has, these days, taken third place in popularity behind the video games and card game, it has no signs of slowing down. It's undeniably the secret to the franchise's success. And let's be honest, the anime series will probably continue to air until the sun burns out. Uh, take care, Butterfree! Good luck, buddy! It is incredible to see the journey that Pokemon has been on over the years to become such a massive global hit. Whether it's the TCG, the video games, or the anime, they've all played a massive part, and so have we too. But here's my question for you guys, how did you get into Pokemon? Let us know in those comments below.